It's an honor to uh, to welcome Quaqualtin. Uh, is that more or less properly mm -hmm. pronounced? Apologies if not. Uh, Gary John, who's a, a leader and activist from Salal uh, uh, in uh, what is uh, known by most Canadians as British Columbia, uh, in the Upper Fraser River. Salal, uh, I understand, is the people of the lakes. Uh, Anderson and Blue Seton, Heron. Blue Heron people, um, are part of the, uh, the Stadlim nation in the, in the Upper Fraser. Um, and um, the uh, full and formal introduction will be given by Sarah Moritz, who is known to several of us here, but not to everyone. Sarah's at an advanced stage of her PhD program. Um, uh, will be submitting, as I understand, in the next few months, her dissertation. Uh, so she's been away, and, and um, some of you who've come more recently won't uh, know Sarah. Uh, but uh, uh, welcome back, Sarah. And, uh, this semester, uh, she is teaching uh, a senior undergraduate seminar uh, on uh, Indigenous contemporary issues for the department. So she's been around a bit, and some of you have been. I've had the pleasure of interacting with her uh, uh, while she's back. So, over to you, Sarah. Before I uh, begin introducing Paul uh, Colton Gary John, I'd like to um, do a traditional territory acknowledgement. Um, I'm using McGill's official acknowledgement, and that goes, McGill University is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg nations. McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we meet today. Thank you. Kat wa'alap ama Ets Kontina, Ama Schkeit, Kamuch Stum Mus Kahwa. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, welcome to everyone uh, to to this talk um, today on the International Day uh, of Water, or the International Water Day. Um, this is Gary and, and I are particularly. Um, proud uh, the talk is, is time for today. And um, I'm absolutely delighted and honored to introduce my long-term research partner, mentor, and friend, Paul Carlton Gary John, um, as today's stand and cicada co-sponsored talk speaker. Gary has had many important roles in his uh, life as a leader and activist. He has served as elected chief for his community, Chlath, for over uh, 18. 18 years, as the chair of the Stadtium Chiefs Council, as Aboriginal member to the Council of Canadians, and has been particularly instrumental in advising on issues to do with water and water rights and the sacredness of water. Internally and internationally, he has been a shit disturber on the ground, fighting in solidarity for indigenous rights um, and title to ancestral lands. He's been an international indigenous delegate to the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and for putting pressure on Canada to honor the United Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. He's, uh, as I said, particularly proud to be presenting on, the, on World Water Day because water is an important issue to his community and his nation. And when he works and speaks, I want to say it's always from the heart, through his drum, from the ground and with a big thunder. Gary's talk today is titled Self-Determination in the Face of Wreck Conciliation, a Schlafmuch Stachium reflection on four decades of activism and drumming. <coughs> and he will begin his talk through song and he will close his talk by song. And before handing the mic over to Gary, I want to say a profound Thank you to everybody, all of my colleagues at Cicada, uh, Colin Scott, the director, uh, Stephen Schnur for providing technical support and filming this and making it available to the world out there. 
um, to Lucia for helping arrange this trip and everybody else I, I'm not mentioning to stand to you and Nick have been particularly supportive. Without uh, any of you, this wouldn't wouldn't be possible. So, Kuckstuch. And now on to Gary. <coughs> well, thank you everyone for um, really happy to be here today and grateful for the opportunity to just to be here to, to share some of the stuff that I've been involved in, some of the stuff, the work that Sarah and I have been doing. Um, you know, last night I had the opportunity to witness firsthand a shutout by Carey Price and Canadians. It's <laughs> quite a thrill as well. <coughs> it's really great being uh, in Montreal. It's not my first time, um, but the first time I've had so far uh, so much opportunity to look at different things in the city and uh, enjoy the time here. And it's not over yet. Um, <coughs> But I am going to open with a song. The this, this song is the uh, East West song, which in our language translates to the loon. Uh, the loon is uh, significant in our creation story because uh, our, our land was flooded, and as the waters receded, they were, we were trying to, the people then were trying to figure out or is, it, is it time to jump out of the canoe yet? Is, are we getting close, or do we, how much longer do we have to plan on being in the canoe to? to survive because they were getting down to um, not very much left to eat and not very much left to survive on so they needed to get back on land. So they kept sending different animals overboard to dive deep down to try and see if they were getting close, if they were getting close to land yet but the water was deep and the frog, the different other birds tried and then finally the loon, um, the loon took a deep dive and said I'll, I'll go and try. And uh, the loon dove and dove and dove, and uh, he came back up. He surfaced. Um, he he died, but um, he had um, the mud on his, on the bill of his beak. So they knew that um, the, there were people there who uh, performed ceremony and brought the loon back to life. But uh, um, so when they they knew that it was getting time, so as time passed. They got out of the canoe, and when they were coming down, they sang this song of gratitude to the loon. So it's a really important uh, song in our culture. And when, when we sing it to ladies, you get up and dance, and you have um, gestures that show appreciation for the land, remembering the loon and the story of our creation, um, when it happened, where it happened. But it's a really beautiful song. It's a really beautiful dance that the ladies do when we're back home and they do this. <coughs> So you'll see by the, me and my drum have been uh, around the world a couple of times. I've put little stickers on there and different people have signed it. But um, for me the drum has been a powerful teaching tool, it's been a powerful learning tool. It helps us in so many ways back home in our territory. <coughs> and our drumming is, um, our songs have been shared across Turtle Island and around the world. Um, but the drums have become an, an important tool for us to use. It, it helps us gather, it helps us get grounded, it helps us keep um, rhythm both metaphorically and physically. And it's important for us, we, we, we like to make loud noises, our, our singing is really loud, it's, sometimes it can be quite radical. And we've got songs that uh, where 
we songs to instill fear in the people that we want to be scared sometimes. But at the same time, we use our, our songs for soothing children and babies and maybe calming down events, but together and, and uh, center people. So that's why the, the drum is, uh, holds so many, um, has so much meaning for us in our territory. <coughs> anyway, Sarah mentioned I'm from a, fall, a small community deep in the mountains in British Columbia, and I live where it can here, you point. <coughs> the top button. Yeah, tiny little speck out in the middle of nowhere. <coughs> but um, over the years, I've had several opportunities to, to learn from, from great leaders. I remember sitting in some meetings when I was really young, listening and being nosy and being inquisitive. Um, my name, Qualcolton, translates to someone who speaks with conviction, or it can also be an interpreted to also be to mean a loud noise like thunder. <coughs> and that name was given to me by my uncle several years ago when a ceremony is held, or a uh, gathering is held in our community, and my sisters called upon a couple of my uncles to see if there was a name in the family that could be handed down and, and given to me to use and to, to carry. <coughs> but yeah, but that's, this is home. Um, I lived, lived there, grown up there, spent most of my life there and had the opportunity to do some pretty significant things uh, over the years. Um, and a lot of things have happened around there over the past 20 to 30 years. Thanks to some um, died in the world active and died, die hard activism and some really strategic thinking with some key people over the years. Um, You'll hear some of the discussion that we've had about um, uh, a time uh, when we had battle with Ainsworth Lumber back in our territory, and they wanted to log across the lake from our village. <coughs> right there, they wanted to put 27 miles of, of road along the mountainside. But our people said that can't happen. <coughs> Once again, we used our drums and we mounted a, an opposition to this that took many different roles. We were on the line doing direct action. We were publicizing and letting people know uh, as much as possible why we're doing this. It's not just because we don't like logging or we were anti-economic development, but we have some very um, succinct beliefs about what's there and there's a lot of evidence on the ground, if you were to spend a couple of days out there, you'd have the opportunity to see, see, see for yourself. <clears throat> Aside from the fact that this is just across the, the logging plans, we're just a mile across the lake from my community, so every morning I would have woken up to a, a clear-cut patch, and those aren't very appealing, especially given that uh, the, area is already, the area around the community has already been impacted by hydroelectric development. Um, the lake that I live on is, uh, has been dammed by BC Hydro. There's a BC rail, or CN rail now has a, a train, set of train tracks that runs right in front of my community. I remember growing up, and we used to do this, you could, you could hit a rock from where my bedroom was. It was that, that's how close we were to the train tracks. And then there's been mining development that also, also impacted us. So it's a miracle, it's a, it's a major miracle that our land is still able to sustain us given all of the impacts that it's endured already. So we said, no, so we don't want it logged. Go and log somewhere else. But it led to, uh, uh, we had to roll in the mud and the blood and sweat and uh, prove to the logging company, to the province of British Columbia, this isn't a good thing to do, not here, not ever. Unfortunately, and I, I guess quite ironically, even though we won that battle, um, the mountain, the fire struck the mountain and burned off quite a bit of the timber that the logging company wanted to, and they said that, well, one guy in Lowood had this, he said he had this vision or a dream or a nightmare. <laughs> he said he had his vision that Gary John was dancing on top of the mountain, waving some feathers as of, as of flames were consuming the wood. <laughs> I thought that's, I don't, know, I don't know what he was smoking or drinking before he, he went to bed that night, but it's a funny story to tell. Next, yeah. So um, we talked about reconciliation, and you notice I, I, that's my, my definition of what I see. It's a, 
it's an attempt at reconciliation that we hear, but we're, we hear talked about and we see it, um, the Prime Minister getting his headdress and a lot of flowery language. <coughs> but since um, time immemorial and is written in our declaration, we face tremendous hardships, we face tremendous challenge. May 10, 1911, our chiefs in our territory traveled uh, ironically <laughs> to another territory and had this document written up talking about our uh, inherent title to our territory and the right to float in that title. I know the courts say rights and title, but our people are pretty firm in our belief that it's, we have rights that flow from our, our title to the land. The government and the courts would love it if we believed otherwise, but that's just not going to happen. <coughs> so our chiefs wrote that down, and that document, the Declaration of the Little Tribe, has basically essentially become our Magna Carta. It becomes our our walking orders, the principles that that help us, that help help guide us as we move forth, dealing with all of the challenges uh, in and about the territory, and that means that sometimes working together. So once in a while, there's disagreements from one community to the other, but the strength of our nation is the fact that we can gather in a room like this, even if we don't disagree. All 11 communities will be represented in the room, despite perhaps uh, from time to time differences of opinion on approach or strategy. We will uh, celebrate and gather and uh, for the past uh, couple of dozen years now or the last dozen years and, and some change, we have been gathering and we gather annually in one of the 11 Stathlin communities that are there today to commemorate the, the struggle that we've, the struggles that we've had over the years and where we are now <coughs> and discuss about where we're going with all of these various issues that face our people. <coughs> and I mentioned um, from time to time, that means that we do some solidarity work across the country. We've been to support the Mohawks when they had the situation that erupted in 1990. Later on, we've been over supporting the, uh, the folks at Burnt Church. <coughs> uh, today, ironic, um, I, I guess it's poetic, it could be ironic, symbolic. Today, the Chilcotin Nation, our northern neighbors who we used to battle with fiercely, historically, we used to wage war on them. Sometimes it seemed like we were bored, so we'd go and pick a fight with the Chilcotin or vice versa. So we have a lot of great war stories. <coughs> but several years ago, uh, these two fierce warring nations got together and said, if we can fight to get against each other with such um, tenacity, can you imagine what would happen if we joined together? The Chilcotin have uh, won, uh, to some extent, a title case in Supreme Court, and they recently uh, successfully battled to save Fish Lake and their territory from mining effluent being dumped into one of the lakes. But they're having they're in the court. They're going to be in the courts today, doing much. They're going back to the the battleground more and more times. So we're going to be there in solidarity with them. But I wanted to acknowledge our sisters and brothers in the Chilcotin Nation today because of what they're having to endure one again. <coughs> this is Chief, uh, former Chief Roger William celebrating one of their uh, recent victories a couple of years ago. Sechnalia in their language means um, thank you. So I was raising his hand in victory. I thought he was giving the government the middle <laughs> finger. <laughs> but it turns out in the, in the gambling world that we have with our drums, uh, there's a gambling game you can play and you can point. So he said he was pointing one way or the other with uh, symbolizing that they'd won because of the decision that they made. So I want to acknowledge them, and as well as the fact that it's World Water Day as well. So I understand McGill's once again um, having discussion about banning bottled water on the campus. So hopefully that holds. <coughs> and then um, my old friend uh, Maud Barlow is somewhere in the city going to be speaking tonight, so it's pretty, uh, maybe we'll cross paths again. What's next? <coughs> so the land and, and what it means to us and what we get from the land. <coughs> it's hard to, uh, like I said, in, in spite of all of the impact that we've had from logging and mining and railways being built and hydroelectric development. The land is still um, plentiful enough and has survived enough that it can provide everything that we need. Still, we can, I can still 
walk outside the door of my house and pick berries from the land. I can uh, have to travel, unfortunately now due to some of the impacts, we now have to travel a little bit further to do the fishing, but that's some of our uh, salmon drying in the wind. Uh, little, it's getting a little bit harder now with all of the pressures and the changes and some of the things that have happened. <coughs> but um, nevertheless, we, we persevere and we find ways to get by. Uh, it doesn't mean it's easy, but uh, if it was easy, it, it, somebody else would be doing it and it would have happened a, long, a lot longer. But that's part of the reason as well that we fight so fiercely in the courts, on the ground, to make points and impress upon the governments, on different entities, why the land is so important to us. And when we get down to talking about the, the, the land and the stewardship, it's a, re a stewardship responsibility that we have the land to look after the land. And quite frankly, if, if the, we don't look after the land, the land's not going to have the ability to, con to continue to provide for us. Um, does that lead us? Where does that lead us? So BC Hydro probably is the biggest cumulative impact on our people over the years. I live, currently now live where BC Hydro built their facilities. We, we've lived in the shadow of BC Hydro facilities. Uh, they've taken up a pretty significant portion of um, former reserve land. And they were able to do that through mischievous means. They didn't have to pay very much for the land that they took from us. And, and what they told the government and what they told, and this was a, a power company back, a, a private power company before it was BC Hydro. <coughs> but what they conspired with the Indian agent and the gov federal government was, they went and said, we have every legal right to take this land um, legally, but um, you know, here's a few hay pennies, but you're gonna have to tell the chief and the community that if they don't like the deal that we're proposing, we could just expropriate the land anyways. But what came with um, hydro was the, the loss of land, the impacts. Construction happened, there was a few jobs for some people swinging shovels or a hammer or maybe driving a, a pickup truck or a dump truck. <coughs> but what uh, the majority of the opportunity came and it went during the construction phase. Once the facilities were in place, waterways were interfered with um, deer migration routes, berry patches were contaminated with all kinds of herbicides or pesticides. Um, moose, deer, muskrat, beaver had a hard time surviving. In some places, they've been extirpated from uh, some parts of the territory. We still suffer the the unknown impact or the effect of living so closely to hydro generation facilities. There's the unknown impact of living so close to it electromagnetic fields, and it's one of the things that uh, we still have an ongoing discussion, debate with BC Hydro, and in some cases the federal government, and in some cases provincial government, because we have higher rates of cancer, leukemia, schizophrenia, lupus, and a, a whole range of other diseases that they may be related, there may be a cause and effect, or there may be a cumulative effect with electromagnetic fields, contaminated water, uh, long-term exposure to herbicides and pesticides, but those are all unknown situations. But uh, suffice to say, BC Hydro has been the biggest single impact, but when you look at all of those other ones, it's, it's, uh, it's a miracle that our people are still able to thrive as much as we are today. I think it speaks to the tenacity and the perseverance of our, the spirit of our people. The, I mentioned the loss of fish. Fish used to swim up the, the Bridge River prior to, and the people, they talk about how big these Chinook salmon or spring salmon or king or tai, depending on what part of the uh, area, wh where you're from and what they, how they see these fish. But we're told that uh, from our people that the fish used to weigh in an area of 90 pounds. That's a big spring salmon to be swimming that far up the Fraser River. The, this would have been their head, the headwaters where they were born and where they go back to. But once they built a dam, the fish couldn't get past the dam. There's still no fish passage today. 
but the loss of that fish in, in the diet was, is, uh, had a significant impact to our people. But it also meant we just not that the fish weren't there, we couldn't fish there anymore, so we had to move <laughs> our fish in place. Uh, we, d we did settle a, a deal with BC Hydro a few years ago um, that's pretty, pretty, a pretty significant deal for our people. But as the discussions were going on with BC Hydro, <coughs> we talked about, well, is it, the BC Hydro had some people hired. And they said, well, is it possible? We know you lost the protein that comes with salmon. And it's really good protein that you lost. <coughs> but is it possible to replace that with something else? And they, they did some comparisons and they talked to dietitians, excuse me. And they found a chicken probably that had the best, the best comparative amount of protein available. <coughs> um, we said, well, that's not quite going to work because we know that if you're fishing for spring salmon, your mesh has to be about, I don't know, anywhere from four to six inches. And if you're just fishing for sockeye, sockeye salmon, you're probably looking at about two, somewhere between the four um, inches to catch them in a gillnet. But we said, we, we don't know what size gillnet you use to catch a chicken with, so <laughs> it's going to need some more research. <coughs> they didn't appreciate the humor um, or, or the sarcasm, but we said, you, you, can't just, you can't just give us chickens. You can't even just say, you know what, we'll go and catch you guys a couple of cooler fulls of salmon and, and give them to you guys. It's important to be able to teach our children how to fish, where to fish, when to fish, what kind of preparations do you go? It's, it's the preparation that we go, we um, we do for uh, wind drying is is different. Um, the the all these various processes uh, can't just be. We can't just start doing something different uh, that easily. It's taken us a while to adapt. We have adapted, but it is it is tough to convey how important and how significant this is to our people to try to get BC uh, BC Hydro to understand it. Nevertheless, we did, we were successful in resolving or resolving some of the issues. On uh, May 10, 2011, we signed a $206.3 million deal with BC Hydro, the largest treaty or largest agreement outside of the treaty making process to date and a pretty significant agreement for the province of British Columbia. And I always like to say that in spite of the province of British Columbia and their policies and legislation that they're using and what they call laws, we were able to ink an agreement. Um, <coughs> uh, so 10, 10 communities participated in that process. One of the 11 opted out because they felt they could, they would be able to do uh, an arrange, uh, come to some terms of an agreement with BC Hydro on their own. So we've honored that commitment, but it's, it's created a bit of a change, but it's gonna take a bit of a, uh, take a little while longer for BC Hydro to understand that they really do need to do things differently. The past is the past, it's history. Um, we can't change it, but we can change what happens from here going forward. But unfortunately, a lot of the people that are, were on the other side of the table when we were negotiating with BC Hydra, they're gone, they were contractors, their contract is, uh, their contract is finished, they've moved on, so we've got new people at the table and we're gonna have, we're gonna have to educate them all over again and hopefully, that, hopefully they're gonna be there for a while because the term of the of agreement is uh, 50 years. BC Hydro said, well, none of us are going to be around here in 50 years. And I said, well, that goes for your side of the table. I plan on being here for, <laughs> I may not have much marbles bouncing around up top, but I, I hope I'm still here when the 50th anniversary for the agreement uh, comes and goes so that we can see what kind of change actually happened. Could I just ask you, please, what is that curved structure? In the Oh, that's, a, that's to stop logs from, the dam is further down to the left of the picture. So Colin's asking what that is. That's just a log, this is a boom to catch any debris from floating down because they didn't log this valley before they flooded it. So what happens is trees that are rooted in the ground will pop up and they all come down and, cre and create a mess in front of the, the spillway that in the event that there's a, a spill. So they want to make sure they, they try and get those and pull them out of the water. <coughs> so just to give you a visual, um, this is bridge power plant and our generation station number two. This is number one. We had people living uh, just uh, about here. 
this original, this original plant was built and uh, was generating power in uh, 1927. This one was built and completed in the 50s. This one was uh, completed in the 60, early 60s. But power still hadn't, even though power had been generated here in 1927, I believe was when it started, uh, this home didn't have power until 1974, even though it's that close. And as much the same for the rest of the people in the community that we didn't have power until early 1970s. So even the home I grew up in didn't have power when I don't remember, I was really young when we first moved into that house, but uh, people still remember packing water uh, because there was no indoor plumbing back then, right? So it is, it, despite the fact that BC Hydro had these very beautiful houses, they were um, almost um, heritage model homes that BC Hydro lived in. Meanwhile, a lot of people uh, sat down the road in uh, tents and shacks, so it is a that was one of the stark ironies that we continually pointed out to BC Hydro over the years in the, of negotiation. <coughs> mineral claims are historical mineral claims in the valley, and uh, some that are some have been abandoned, but this has had a tremendous impact on us as well. Um, just if you look at the occurrence of methylmercury, and I'm not an expert in methylmercury, but when you create a man-made lake, you have an, in, uh, an increase for a period of time in the occurrence of methylmercury. That's a concern in the, in the mining process that happens in the mines. They use uh, mercury to extract gold. Um, we don't know what the long-term impact is because the water would flow out of there into Carpenter Lake, then be piped through the mountains to the generating stations and flow into Seton Lake where we live. So you've got water that's been consumed by birds and animals that's a part of the water cycle, leaching on or falling on the, the plants and vegetation. And then uh, water being in, uh, going through here, uh, picked, up by, picked up by salmon and uh, different animals in the in and around the watershed. So it might be safe to continue eating fish and berries and plants and medicines. We don't quite know. That's one of the unknowns that uh, we in BC Hydro agreed once everything was settled, that health impacts related to um, BC Hydro are, aren't on the table. They haven't been resolved yet. We may, may go back to that. <coughs> but again, is it to make matters worse, there's a cumulative impact of mining uh, accompanied with the impact of hydroelectric development. So that's good for that one. <coughs> Logging being another big impact to migration routes and habitat and the quality of life. The thing that disturbs us most about all of these logging proposals, some of them are active, some are historic, uh, luckily that one's history. But the problem is uh, first the access that the roads create and the impact that, that come with the roads uh, because they're going into areas that are, have never seen a road before so the animals don't know. But it, uh, our elders are telling us that you interrupt some of those migration routes for the deer and the moose. Um, the moose and the deer have a tough time getting used to it, so they may not frequent some of these areas anymore. That makes it harder for people to hunt. <coughs> um, so in some cases, we've, we've gone to battle over um, one that's most memorable but for my community is the one I mentioned earlier, CP146. That one's off the books now. <coughs> but some of the other ones, we've sat with the logging companies. Um, some of our technical people have, some of our leaders. Sometimes they'll listen, sometimes they don't. Uh, they're changing, you know, they're, they're starting to learn what it takes to, to get along with us. And in some cases that means they may not get to log everywhere that they propose. In some cases they'll have to log, but they have to take out the same volume of timber, perhaps over a longer period of time. In some cases we say, well, just take the bigger trees, don't cut everything down. Just take what you're going to carry out and process at the mill. Um, sometimes we tell them to take it to haul and harvest in the winter because over frozen ground you won't leave as big a footprint or have as big an impact. 
In some cases, we just say, just eliminate this one. There'll be some trade-offs. There's some trade-offs that, that go back and forth. Um, the one over CP146, like I said, we had to get down and dirty, and it got ugly. It, it separated families, it separated communities because of political differences, because of, because of greed. <clears throat> but uh, suffice to say, though, that thankfully, um, we're getting, we're getting to a point where the logging companies are starting to understand that we're not just, like I said, we're not anti-logging, but we just want a lighter hand on the land. We think it's important <coughs> because the other thing that we're concerned about is the uh, impact on other species, not just deer and not just moose, but if you impact the grizzly bear's habitat, that's going to have a trickle effect. They're the apex predator, I guess, as well as uh, what happens with the fish. So in some cases, we've talked to the companies and said, you need a bigger buffer zone around some of the waterways, depending on what, what your plans are. But because there is going to be a cause and effect. If you, ta if you log too close to the waterways, you know, uh, watching the news now back home and in and around our communities now, we're having ex um, excessive runoffs because of the snow isn't landing and staying on the ground like it used to. So now we have runoffs, we have mudslides, um, flooding in, in, case, in places where they haven't seen flooding like that for 50 years. It's starting to happen uh, every other year where they used to have significant flood events. Now every year it seem, seems to be a significant flood event type of year, so they're having to deal with that kind of situation. We're also talking about <coughs> Reintroducing controlled burns as a means to control um, um, undergrowth on the ground because uh, we've seen some explosive situations, but we believe that if you do a controlled set of burns throughout the year or every few years, you can reduce the amount of or the, the type of damage that happens when a large scale heavy fire rolls through a valley or in and out of a valley. So. Uh, keep your fingers crossed because we're holding our breath. We've been fairly lucky, but at the same time, our community has been evacuated twice at least in the last 10 years and near evacuations. Um, but we've, we've been lucky, but you, we're not going to be lucky for that lucky forever. <coughs> I think we the vision that we have, a uh, continued and renewed, renewed relationship between Stadtling people, the Uchelmuch, the people of the land and the land Timuch. Uh, when we look at what uh, was being talked about in the declaration, and we look at the responsibility that we have to pass on knowledge in order to have a good life, uh, it, it's not getting easier, it's getting harder. but. We're starting to find a, a new resolve <coughs> to implore upon our young people to learn these ways and to call upon elders and the knowledgeable ones to pass on his knowledge. Um, because this is, this is what we need to survive in our territory. Uh, it, it'll be different in another tribe's territory. What, what's applied in Shtatlim territory may not work in, in Tuanaka territory down in the Kootenays or in Vancouver Island because the vegetation's different and the land is different. There's different berries, there's different fish. Uh, a Stadlium fish, by the time it reaches our territory, is prime um, during the summer for wind drying. But if we took a salmon from uh, caught off the coast of Vancouver Island, that fish has too much fat content, that content. So if you hung it on one of our dry racks right here, the fat would drip for days and days and days but if you wait until that salmon swam off some of its fat getting up to our territory, by the time it gets to our area, the, the fat content is not as bad. So the, wind, the winds that hit the river at that time of the year will uh, suck enough moisture out to give us the dried salmon that we treasure and we cherish in our territory. But you can't, uh, and not very many tribes in BC can do the uh, dried salmon the way, do, the, the way we do because they just don't have the conditions. 
But they can do other things. They can smoke salmon, uh, or they can um, preserve it uh, other ways that, that we can because the conditions are different in our territory. So we had to get to, it, it's important to bring our children on the land, to bring our people on the land, so that this knowledge is passed on and is transferred, and so that, and some of these methods and techniques uh, for catching food or, or finding food aren't lost, and then the preservation is important. To try and um, put into words, I guess, much like the Declaration, to, to try to put into words and to capture and to have it so it would be on the table and maybe to have it so that it would be easier for the governments and the third party interests in Stadtlim territory to understand what it is we're trying to convey. We developed a land use plan, the land use policy, a code, a, a guide in our territory. It is done by traveling to each of the communities, talking to their knowledgeable people, and putting together a document, a booklet, that would be a, a useful tool when a third party interest approaches the community or approaches the tribe. <coughs> it's been met with some resistance because um, you know, we, we sit across the table from a deputy minister or even a minister and they say, well, we've looked at the, the Statlium land use plan and the code and you know, we, it looks Pretty protective, protective. Uh, pretty, uh, it's pretty extreme when it comes to protecting the land. And we said, "Are you surprised?" I mean, we have, we have, uh, we have battle stories. Uh, CP one forty six is a, is a very prominent one. Uh, I was just up in um, the Duffy Lake corridor a couple of weeks ago, bringing some provisions to my buddy Hubie. He's been out in the land, stopping, helping to stop Nancy Green Rain from building a ski resort smack dab in the middle of Statlam territory. And we've been at that battle for going on. This will be our 19th year. We've been, we built a, a, a camp. We built a home for Hubie up in the middle of the territory so that he can stand vigil and make sure it's known that we don't want a ski resort built here because we, felt, we feel the land is more valuable to us in its current form than it could be if there were seven ski slopes and a, a golf, uh, a couple of um, golf courses and uh, whatever else people want to do in year-round destination resorts. That doesn't hold as much value, value for us as the land currently does. But some, some people just don't get the message. Um, Nancy Green Rain still holds a, an environmental a certificate from Canada saying, yeah, go ahead and build your ski resort. But she hasn't done it because she doesn't want to roll up her sleeves and get into it with the people. <coughs> but like I said, um, They've, they've viewed us, and we've used, we've used uh, that mindset um, to, to have other battles in the territory. Um, I don't know how many have heard about the Stein Valley in British Columbia, but we worked together when there was plans to start building logging roads into the Stein Valley. And we worked with our southern neighbors, the uh, Klikapen, because there's a boundary between the, or it, it sits in part ways in, in Klikapen territory, Part of it sits in uh, Stadlum territory, so we worked together to launch a national and an international appeal to save this part of British Columbia and to don't build logging roads in there. We've also uh, utilized a, simp uh, a similar um, train of thought uh, to stop Hat Creek um, from being uh, coal preserves from be being mined uh, because there was a plan to develop a. a a quarry, I guess, for low-grade um, coal. Uh, but that's another successful battle. We have several that we've done, but <coughs> being able to put it in a booklet, a booklet like this, we hope is going to give other people a chance to say if they want to do something in a territory, it has to meet the, the challenge. It has to pass the test that we have put in place. Now. It'd be great if I could say this is in full implementation. While everybody likes it, we have um, we have not we have yet to get this off the off the table. It's all system draft. It's accepted in principle at all of the communities, but we have yet to push it and get it accepted even by our own leadership back home to be utilized 
um, day in and day out. We have our people are using the using the spirit and intent to push for um, third party interests to either revise their um, development plans in the territory, or in some cases they they, they just back off and they said, you know what, we'll wait. This doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere if we weigh the, the plans against the land use code that the Shadleam have in place. I wish I could come, I wish I could report that it's, it's um, I, I don't think it's that nobody, uh, that it's not fully supported. It's just that it comes with uh, some challenges if it's going to be utilized because we do have quite a few communities have, that have their own uh, economic development aspirations that are going to have, their, those, their own plans are going to have to be weighed against the impacts that we feel um, have to be considered in the land use code. Oh, further to that, we have several areas that we see as absolutely sensitive, and I, I talked about the, how important we see the grizzly bear. We have a, we have a, bear, a song that talks about uh, the grizzly bear and that we dance and uh, we dance to. And those are given the utmost importance. If something's going to have a severe, severe impact on grizzly bear habitat, it's not likely to get support for any type of development plans, including our own plans. Hmm? Oh, yeah, and there's different layers. Um, and uh, I guess it's available for people to look at online. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but there's different layers. There's some, that, uh, there's some areas that, uh, of the plan that deal specifically with water and waterways and fish. There's some that look at moose and deer habitat and trails. There's some that look at um, plant and uh, berry gathering areas and grizzly bear habitat. So they all have to, they all have to be weighed. All of the, the, the various plans and proposals have to be weighed. And it gives us a management tool to, to better manage what's happening on the territory and take into consideration. We're not yet, if, if, we, could, if we could have the, the plan accepted at the leadership table or at the nation table, we'd be in a far better position to develop a, a long-term strategy for stewardship of the land. As it is now, each community is, has their own vision of looking after the area around where they uh, mainly reside. Um, some communities argue about autonomy. My argument back has been that you can't survive just on what's in and around your, your community. You need fish from another part of the territory, you need bears from an, or, uh, berries from another part of the territory, um, and you need to hunt in another part of the territory. If you can get by everything that's in one particular part of the territory, that'd be great, but it's not, it's not the reality. So as much as autonomy is argued for, uh, personally I always argue back the, the, that we have interdependence in and amongst our several 11 communities. And, We'll see. We'll see how that dis those discussion goes. Maybe the next time it'll. The next time I come back, it'll be different. So, we'll touch wood and cross our fingers. <coughs> the deer protection areas are critical. Um, our our elders will tell us that they can. Th I mean, they can tell us that, and it's been proven. Uh, one of our renowned elders and hunters, Albert. Well, tell us, it's, it's almost like he gets a twitch in his elbow or something. He says, yeah, the deer are starting to move from Lytton up to Lillowit and across in the Fraser here. And we said, what did, what did he use? And he says, I just know. He says, he just knows. And sure enough, you make a few phone calls and, and that's what, because he's been out there year after year, either hunting or, or guiding or, or fishing or Sometimes it's not uncommon for he and a few others to just go out and, and I don't know, I guess double check just to check to see if it still holds true. But with what's happening with the environment, times are changing. But this is why it's so critical for us to look after the migration routes because they've said that if you, if you interrupt even just a few trees or wipe out some of the historical paths, the deer get confused or they get spooked and they just 
They just may stop coming. And we've seen that this year. We, we're seeing deer moving um, in the springtime. We see them moving later or in the wintertime. They, they don't move around like they used to. So, and that's why we're trying to implore upon uh, all of these third-party interests, whether they're um, sports, sports clubs or recreation enthusiasts or guiding outfits or people who want to develop mines or logging companies. Keep these in mind when you're looking at your plans. <coughs> um, some, of them are, some of them are getting it. Many are resistant. But um, you know, and we've told them several times and they've reminded that we can do it the easy way where we sit down at the table and be nice and talk things out or we can do it the hard way where we'll see you on the road. We hopefully we don't have to do it that way, but more often than not, that's what it's taken to get to that to find some type of resolution to the situations that we're faced with. We've had a <clears throat> lot of opportunity over the years. One of the um, opportunities that's arisen from the agreement between BC Hydro and Statlium is that we can do some. Uh, work solely on what's happened as a result of BC Hydro coming into the territory and damming water. In, uh, on the Bridge River, <coughs> there was an uncontrolled release of water over BC Hydro's Terzaghi Dam. It took about five years to resolve the matter out of court, and what came out of that was a water use plan. One of the things that these folks here were doing over the past couple of years has been going out to the land, um, going based on the elders' memory, what the waterway was like, how deep the water, how deep the water was, how loud the water was, because it's in a pretty steep canyon, so the, when the water was high, it was just ripping and roaring down the, down the valley. Once the water dropped due to the water being a large amount of the water being trapped, except for the feeder streams on the, below the dam, the water gurgled and babbled a lot more than it used to prior to hydro. So we're trying to see what happens at different times of the year, what the impacts are. And then BC Hydro is, is still wondering, well, how much water, how much more water can release and when can we release it? Um, even though some of the water, uh, the out of court settlement for the 92 case says that now water must flow out of the dam the water that's flowing out, coming out, is coming from the bottom of the dam now. So it's, it's sending warmer water into a fish stream, which is upsetting the, the timing for the emerging fry or for the out migration. And that's a never ending challenge. We're hoping that with some of the work that these chaps are doing, or these folks are doing, sorry, we're going to be able to find a happy medium. Um, but at the same time, it's not without challenges because. We have um, situations that in some cases are beyond even BC Hydro's control, they, so they, they're forced to release more water than they planned, and all of a sudden the plans just get washed away again. And it's like trying to, I, I liken it to trying to build sandcastles in the hopes that the high tide isn't going to come in and sweep away, but that's what we've been dealing with for the past several years. In the 1990s, when we were fighting with Ainsworth and over CP-146, and at the same time the, the battle to save Melvin Creek was emerging, we realized that there, was a, there, we are, there is some kind of method to the madness. <clears throat> and we'd been utilizing a, a four-point strategy that, that talked about direct action, that talked about legal action, that talked about um, making sure your political agenda is straight and making sure you're ready to negotiate. <clears throat> and somebody had an epiphany, I guess, or had a moment and said, you know what, we're missing. We're, in many cases, we've been successful, but in some cases where we hadn't been successful, we forgot about the, the, the obligation that we have for ceremony and for prayer to, to take place. So um, we added one more point to the direct strategy, uh, five-point plan that we have, 
Direct action, if you have to, you've got to get out there on the road. You physically stop the, the, the train or the trucks or even people in some cases. <coughs> but make sure you know who you, who you have, make sure you know who's committed to doing what. And don't expect one group of people to, do, to all have some reinforcements because people burn out and if you have people burning out in your front line, you, your front line gets really weak. So make sure you pace, you pace yourself and uh, know your people. The legal action, would, uh, unfortunately you're going to wind up in court, so make sure you have a good legal argument. Make sure you have lawyers lined up, especially if you wind up in jail and write, your write the lawyer's name on the, uh, we've seen that in direct action all over. <clears throat> but you're going to wind up in legal doo-doo, so have a good legal argument. Make sure your lawyers are, are well versed in your position. Don't let the lawyer tell you what the, the best argument might be. You have to make sure the lawyer, you pick a good lawyer. And we've educated some good lawyers over the years. Um, negotiation. <clears throat> if the opportunity presents itself, you've got to have your ducks lined up. You've got to be ready. If the provincial government or the federal government does want to sit down, or even the third party interest sits down and wants to work something out, make sure you're ready. Make sure you have your your bottom line set, make sure you know what's, you know, what might be a, you might be able to put off to the, off to the side for the time being, or what, what, what your, what your bottom line is, make sure you're aware of that. And then uh, communication and outreach. It's important to know what the message is, why are you doing what you're doing? Yeah. And who's your spokesperson, make sure that spokesperson knows what the overall agenda is, so, and make sure they're not a loose cannon. And make sure you get letters written to mayors, to ministers. Make sure more people, and as many people as possible, know what you're doing so that you can sway public opinion as well and have people supporting your actions in various means. That's absolutely critical, it's absolutely important. <clears throat> and then don't forget that there's a, high, a higher power and there's a reason you're doing this, so call upon your ancestors, call upon the animals and make sure everybody's doing thing and everything with an honorable mind and with a good heart and a clear mind. <clears throat> but as well, equally, or more important I guess, is don't just be prepared. You, gotta, you, you know you're going to have hardline shit to service that just want to fight, that just want to put on a mask and sunglasses and stand on the road. People are important, but that can't be your only plan of attack. It can't be, can't be the only thing you do. If you put too much focus or emphasis on any one of these points and forget about the others, you're not going to be balanced. So it's important to remember that you have to have all of these ready to go and you have to be keeping these in mind as you're moving along. And, um, you know, thankfully over the past several years, this has been a very successful strategy for us. It may not work for everybody, <clears throat> but what, what's important as well is that if somebody does come into Shatlium to lend support to a situation or an issue that we're facing, that they come, they do come to support, and we don't let them have their own agenda while they're out, while they're out there with us. And this just speaks to. Uh, we've got to put up more of these signs throughout our territory to remind people that Shtetlum territory is unceded and we, we claim, according to the declaration, it says that we claim we are the rightful owners to our territory and everything pertaining thereto. And nobody else can speak for us. Um, I, you know, I just mentioned that um, during direct action, you won't see the Shtetlum putting on face masks. We don't disguise our identity because it says in our declaration that we speak the truth and we speak for all of our people. So we're not, we don't need to hide from the RCMP or CSIS or anybody. We're fully prepared and ready and nobody else can do that for us except us. So nobody, we don't need, a, we don't feel the need to disguise or hide our identity. And even if it means we face criminal, crimin, criminal persecution or prosecution, jail time, whatever, if that's what has to happen in order to move the cause forward and make some points, then that's what we'll have to do. And this is, uh, talks about a logging road and a mining road. They wanted to build a logging road between uh, two different um, 
forest districts or regions in the province and to build a road that would in uh, unroaded territory to get um, logs a little quicker to the processing plant and to get mineral ore to closer to the uh, and save hundreds of millions of dollars I guess but we said no that that road is, is dangerous we can't have that road go in, the, in that particular area because it's going to create an access issue and if it, it all starts with the road pretty soon you start to see cabins pop up and then people want to do all kinds of wonderful things once there's a road in there but it's the road that seems to be the gateway for people so that's where we're going to stop them so that's what we did in this one uh, this is another example of what happens what happens now between the Statlium and the, Ch and the Chilcotin working together instead of fighting each other because we were uh, and even then we were, we were both the Statlium were talking to the province the Chilcotin were talking to the province and the province is playing the Chilcotin off against the Statlium and vice versa so actions like this speak volumes to the government and to the ministers and to the other third party interests in our territory so that's why we've uh, felt it is appropriate to put this type of sign up. Is there anything else? <gasps> and then there's the bear. <coughs> <laughs> so there's a human, there, there's a human underneath the, <coughs> underneath the fur. And it's one of our good friends, Jackie Andrews, the bear dancer. <coughs> But for, the, for several years, the Statlium hosted an international indigenous leadership gathering and we brought spiritual leaders and we brought activists from Bolivia, from Peru, who brought them from all over and to talk about, in some cases, the, prof the, the, the prophecies from South America. They talked about the prophecies from North America <coughs> and the spiritual leaders said that we have to share this message, we can't hold on to this message, it's important to to share this knowledge so that everybody, and there's a lot of wonderful things that happened, um, you know, the, when the, a lot of the young naturalists showed up at the gatherings, we thought, oh no, the hippies are here. <laughs> but um, it was those young people that showed up, they said, why is there so much garbage here? And we said, well, what do you, what? You don't have to deal with it. We have to deal with it. Yeah, but if you guys set up a recycling plan, uh, uh, set up a recycling plan for the grounds here. Well, they said we'll show you. Well, so they set it up. It was sorted, and I swear, our, our uh, the amount of garbage has been chucked out in garbage right, bags every day, probably dropped by ninety percent. So it was a valuable opportunity for us to learn. But <clears throat> we did bring leaders, and uh, it was it was an international gathering, but it wasn't our gathering it is gathering that we hosted and as part of a prophecy that one of our um, uh, beloved leaders uh, cook be mike, mike leach had a vision about that type of gathering happened in our territory so it carried on for eight years and uh, the the message that they got is now it's time for another nation somewhere be it in to the east of us or be it in, in the united states or somewhere in south america that's where the gather needs to to move to so this is a picture that was held. Sarah was there to observe. I had the honor to be the, um, the chair for the, the Master of Ceremonies for the four days that each of the gatherings was held, and it was held for eight successive years, which is quite, a, uh, quite an event to put on every year. Um, as the last several years wound up being on a, a friend of ours, Chief Daryl Bob's property, and he was very, very gracious, uh, but a lot of, really phenomenal things happened and it is a, a, a really good sharing opportunity. There's a lot of ceremonies held on the ground over the four or five days of the gathering. I don't know, I think there was probably 70 or 80 sweat lodge ceremonies held during that time, which is in, incredible. And then a number of pipes and sacred objects were brought out that hadn't been um, taken up for a number of years. And uh, so just another one of the things that we were able to work together on over the years. So, Thank you. Yeah, you can, as long as nobody, I'm going to have to um, copyright it, I guess, or something. <laughs>
before Mark Zuckerberg does it. <laughs> That was great. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question about the, the thing that's on everyone's mind. Oh, damn. I'm on Sorry. <laughs> I forgot. No, I don't care. Um, okay, I just forgot about it. I used to zoom it over to me. And um, uh, <laughs> the pipeline. And I understand that, because I just looked it up, the Squamish, Lithuets, region is slated for, if I've got this correct, part of the Trans Mountain Pipeline project. What, is, what does this mean for you in terms of mobilization and coordination with uh, other uh, First Nations? What, what is happening? Well, we've taken the position that there will be, no, be no pipeline built in Statlium. Yeah. The, the, um, the one that got a lot of attention over the past couple of months was a liquefied natural gas pipeline that has been proposed in the northern part of our territory. And I, uh, interestingly enough, it would have crossed some of the, the same, um, in one of the slides, it would have crossed some of the same land between the Chilcotin and the Shtatlium nations. But uh, so far, um, I think the market tanked or something that the LNG pipeline that's being proposed is not not seen as a, perhaps viable or feasible at this moment in time. I'm not sure, um, but that one won't be built. Um, and we're in full alliance with other nations that are um, taking a position of opposition against um, pipelines, especially the uh, Kinder Morgan so, and the Trans Mountain. But am I correct in understanding that there are some uh, uh, Native uh, First Nation communities that are in support. Yeah, they're, they're talking about all kinds yeah. of things. They're talking about buying an interest in the pipeline itself that hasn't been resolved yet. I don't know if um, Canada is going to give them a good deal if and when the opportunity arises. But it's interesting as well, though, that Canada now owns uh, the pipeline, and but they're also pushing it at the same time. So there's there's an obvious conflict of interest in there, and I don't know why the ethics commissioner isn't doing their job in this country, um, let alone a lot of the other things in the manner in which consultation has occurred. Um, but given the tone and the, the party line that we're seeing from the Prime Minister, the, that's why I spell reconciliation W-R-E-C-K, because this is certainly not the type of reconciliation that I have in mind. But this seems to be the type that uh, fits the bill for the Liberal government at this point. Or, at least the Prime Minister. Nick has a question. Thank you. I see if I may uh, speak a uh, language that has been spoken for time immemorial and is still spoken in uh, many of the lands I call home, Chi uh, Miigwech, uh, and um, I'm wondering if there are any uh, non statlium nature conservation um, operations happening in in your territory and if so what categories of conservation or nature protection uh, are those operations um, sort of like a provincial why a provincially protected government <coughs> like national protected uh, local um, and uh, how does the, the, the Stadtling land use code uh, harmonize or not with um, existing or potential uh, non Stadtling nature conservation operations? Well, we're, we're at the table um, with a lot of the plans that are in place, um, but we agree that some areas need that level of protection. In some cases, some of the communities have jointly agreed that the, that the, some areas can be set aside. But we say that this can't be a decision that the province of British Columbia makes alone. And that's what the, we did have a, a process that we tried to embark upon with the provincial government a few years ago called the government to government process. And we said that it shouldn't be just the province of British Columbia having the 
the only say about what happens and when it happens and who can do this and, and how they can do it because we're certainly uh, an order of government, uh, unfortunately not recognized by the province of British Columbia. But we've been here for a long time and we're aware of what exists on the land base. But why is it up solely up to one level of government to have all the say? We did try to talk about some of those differences of opinions at the table, but it, it turns out that the province, it was premature for the province of British Columbia to be sitting down at that time talking about much of those things. It seemed like they bit off more than they could chew because they kept on saying that, you know, I as the Minister of Forests and Lands cannot fetter the discretionary decision-making power of a discretionary decision-making. And we said, Sir, you're telling us and that the sole voice to say yay or nay to a proposal lies with the, the a deputy minister or a, a regional director or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and they weren't willing to talk about uh, joint decision making. They give it lip service a lot of times, but it always has to fit somewhere within the confines with um, provincial law or, or statutes and um, then that's problematic for us. So um, I think there are some areas that, are, that have been set aside. Um, and we're not about to question those at right now at this point. There's a there's a bigger, a broader global issue that we're trying to deal with. So, um, I guess I have a somewhat related question um, tying into um, that what you say has to fit in one way or another. And I'm so impressed by all your work and especially also by the land use plan and how you put that together. And I was wondering, you said you mentioned that you have met, you have been met with uh, resistance according to that it's too strict, but I also wonder how it is met with resistance according to taking the knowledge seriously that has gone into there. And if you could speak to that, so that is question how you put the knowledge together. <coughs> well, it's interesting that, um, you know, it's as, almost as soon as a, a court case comes down and uh, the, the minutes of the decision are made available, the province sits down and says, well, what does page 17, paragraph 7 say about this, that, or something else? And almost within hours, in many cases, the province comes out to their interpretation of the court case. And they revise, um, conveniently revise their um, legislation or their policy to incorporate their interpretation of the the court case, and and then they try to tell us that no, this is a, this is the law of the land. This is the way it's going to be done, and we just tell them that that's policy and legislation based on the provinces or a minister's interpretation of the court case. This is the way we see it. So um, we, we're, we're going to wind up at, at odds again. We're and we're going to go through the same old thing again. So. Um, we're hopeful that uh, instruments like the land use plan could be taken more seriously by the province of British Columbia. But as yet, uh, you know, it, it kind of goes along with the, the notion of while they, they may feel a moral obligation to sit and talk with us very nicely, legally they don't have to, so they're doing a risk assessment. And they gracefully um, acknowledge that we assert our jurisdiction to the land as opposed to what the courts have said that Aboriginal title and rights has not been extinguished and carries with it several situations or issues that the province has to reckon with. So and it's unfortunate that we're at that point despite so many overwhelming, uh, so many areas where the courts have um, been favorable to our position not just in our territory, but across the province and across the country. Thank you. Thank you. I think following right from that, um, I was wondering, you mentioned the, the Shilkotin court victory. Mm -hmm. I wondered, has that changed the conversation at all in Stratlium? Has there, is there, did it make, has it made any? Um, well, it does because, you know, in, in every court case, there's, there's wins and there's losses. There's things that were good about the court case and there's some things that it just left a lot of unknowns yet. It's left a lot of what's, uh, 
So the court has recognized our Aboriginal title to this much of the territory. Um, so what happens to the rest? It doesn't re automatically revert. So I think that's some of the things that are going to have to be. They're going to have to go back to the. They're going to have to go back into that arena to resolve. Um, we have. Um, through ceremony with the Chilcote and agreed that we're not going to war as fiercely as we did before and that we're going to work together, we're going to exercise or we're going to recognize each other. And um, my uh, late friend Arthur Manny also used to say that it's more important that uh, we as nations recognize one another um, because if we keep on saying, no, our, our voice is louder, or we have a better position than, than you guys do, so trying to win favor with the province doesn't do either of us any good. It really benefits the province of British Columbia or, or Canada. Um, but we're hoping that um, we don't dig up some of the old battle axes that we put to, put to rest, um, and that we can continue to dialogue. So that's what we're really trying to do is maintain a really good line of communication with all of our neighbors on, on all of our borders with the nation so that we can talk to the, the Shushwap, we can talk to the Shukapam, we can talk to the Chilcotin openly instead of letting the province just dictate what we should be what we should be talking about. with some good lawyers, educating uh, some lawyers, and also the participation of people from different walks of life uh, in your gatherings. I was just wondering how you see the role of allies in your community struggle. <coughs> well, we, we couldn't do a lot of the work that we've, we've done without the help of allies um, putting pressure. You know, when we were protesting the ski resort, our friends in, in Germany and Europe were marching on the, the embassies and in, in, uh, they were marching on the Canadian embassy saying, hold on, we're way over here in Europe, but don't think we're not aware of what's going on. Canada, you claim to be a, a champion for human rights, but it looks like you're not even doing a very good job in your own backyard. So they can provide some really good pressure on governments and the third party interests that may be trying to move into your territory. But we are very cautious at the same time, uh, like I mentioned earlier about if making sure that they continue to support our position and we don't get somebody's um, position trying to dominate or, or trying to steal the, the platform that we're working from and on. And we hope that we can lend uh, support to the allies if and, time, if and when the time um, happen or, or it's needed. Yes. Hi, thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about your drum. Mm -hmm. um, you say that it's soothing, but it's also part of, of battling. And it seems, and you also speak about the importance of transmitting a message and what, what people don't get a message. And so I'm just wondering uh, if you could just expand a little bit more on its role and its force. Well, um, you know, our, our, our songs and, and our dances and our language, our culture was almost destroyed by, by colonization, by the churches and the residential schools. And, you know, there was a point in time when all of our, our instruments and even our clothing and our articles, uh, pipes and medicine bundles were, were taken and they were destroyed and condemned and outlawed. So it wasn't easy. Um, you know, there's, there's a special bunch of women in our history, in our territory, that kept singing our songs and kept dancing our dances in spite of that challenge. <clears throat> because I can't imagine what it would be like um, thinking that our songs were only mythical and were only things of legend, but I can sing the same song that was sung 2,000 years ago in our territory and the, the land and the language and the people are, are so interconnected. Um, 
and we and you use the tools that you can you, when you use them in the way that you need to when you can. Um, I've never clubbed anybody over the head with my drum or my drumstick, <laughs> but I will use it to get the attention. You know, in 2010 when the the prime minister and uh, they were opening the Olympics in Vancouver. I was marching down Beatty Street with the same drum, making a noise, saying, hold on, I, I'm not against the Olympics. And if somebody would see fit to give me a ticket to the gold medal hockey game, I'd be, I, I would accept it. But let's, let's keep in mind here that Canada doesn't, does not have a clean track record. There's a lot of things that need to happen. Human rights, not just with Indigenous people, but the, the human rights record of Canada. What do they support and what do they contribute to in other countries? So, you know, um, if it was just the Olympics and if it was just about sport and it wasn't so politicized, then it'd be great. But me and my drum had to make a journey down there to help to make a point. Because I wasn't the only person, there were thousands of others right beside me marching for various causes and for, and for various issues. Um, but in ceremony, this drum, the same drum has been with me. And I'm cautious about how I use it and when I use it and where I use it. And I, I don't, I won't do it, won't ever do bad things with it. It's, it's special to me. But at the same time, some people have said and said, well, I'm, I'm just going to take your drum for you. And they said, you know what, you can. It, it, it's deer hide and it's wood and a, a couple of pieces of metal. But I can bang in anything and make noise with it. I don't need this, but it's, it's useful and it's helpful and, it, and it's special to me. So that's the significance of it. You mentioned you also use it in lullabies? Pardon me? Did you mention, if I, I don't know if I heard correctly at the beginning, that you use it also as a to sing lullabies? Oh, yeah, we can. Yes. Oh, we have a whole bunch of different songs. We have songs about the deer and the bear, and we have songs for, for children and songs to commemorate people. You know, I had a song come to me a few years ago. We were bringing some ancestral remains home that were at um, UBC and in the Museum of Vancouver. And uh, people said, we, we don't have a song for doing that kind of work. So I put out some prayers. I, I thought, but I'm not, I'm not a song maker. Uh, uh, but I, I can sing the songs and I can learn the songs from other people. But this song did, did come to me and I've allowed it to be used for bringing the ancestral remains home from faraway places because our remains are in, in Europe, they're in New York City, they're, they're all over the places, they're, they're items of curiosity, um, perhaps more a uh, hundred years ago than they are now. And museums are wanting to return them because it's the right thing to do. So um, yeah, it, it, it has a, very, a variety of uses and you can use it many different ways. So. So it's a song we, we'll sing at the end of our gatherings and uh, the people that get up and dance do kind of waving gestures when they're singing and, or when they're dancing. And, um, and uh, it's just a song to say, have a good trip, farewell, and until we see you again. <laughs>